oversight and investigations will come to order. The subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on accessibility for people with disabilities on national parks and public lands. Under committee rule 4F, any oral opening statements at hearings are limited to the chair and the ranking minority member or their designees. This will allow us to hear from our witnesses sooner and help members keep their schedules. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent that all other members opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they are submitted to the clerk by 5 p.m. today or the close of the hearing, whichever comes first. Hearing no objection, so ordered. Without objection, the chair may also declare a recess subject to the call of the chair. As described in the notice, statements, documents, or motions must be submitted to the electronic repository at hnrcdocs at mail.house.gov. Additionally, please note that as with in-person meetings, members are responsible for their own microphones. As with our in-person meeting, members can be muted by staff only to avoid inadvertent background noise. Finally, members or witnesses experiencing technical problems should inform the committee staff immediately. And with that, I will make my opening statement. Welcome to the first Natural Resources Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee hearing of the 117th Congress. It's an honor to serve as chair. In the coming months, we will be fair and we will be going aggressive. We will complete investigations into the previous administration that are underway, and we will hold the current administration accountable. Oversight fundamentally is about shining a light on problems. Sometimes we will turn the light on corporate polluters and special interests more interested in making a buck than preserving the fiscal and environmental health of our country. Sometimes we'll use it to focus on ways in which the government can and must do better. My hope is that we'll do this important work in a bipartisan manner. Ranking member Gosar, we have worked together in the past on issues including mental health care for veterans and getting foreign money out of local elections. You've served on this subcommittee for years, and I hope that we can forge a productive working relationship as chair and ranking member, starting with today's hearing on accessibility for people with disabilities on parks and public lands. Since coming to Congress a little over two years ago, I've made it a priority to amplify the voices of people with disabilities. I fought back against large corporations who put their profits before workers or patients with disabilities. I've introduced legislation to stop violence against individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and I've advocated for funding for educational programs to support children with disabilities who should have the same opportunities as their peers. There are parts of our lives that many of us can take for granted, like going hiking or climbing or canoeing on public lands. In Orange County, we are fortunate to have beautiful parks that make accessibility a priority. The Braille signage on the Burns Loop in Laguna Beach and the wheelchair accessible paths at Irvine's Great Parks are just a few examples I see in the 45th district. But this isn't the case everywhere. When I was growing up, vacations were at national parks, not just because they were beautiful or historic, but because we were a working class family and we could afford them. We went to Mesa Verde, the Black Canyon, the Great Smoky Mountains, and the Niobrara National Scenic River. Later in life, public lands became a place to find adventure and refuge. And now as a mother of three children, parks are a classroom, a playground, and once again, a place to bond with families. All Americans should have those opportunities. But for people with disabilities, our national parks and public lands come with many challenges. And those challenges vary widely from person to person. For some, the biggest challenge may be physical barriers, like whether there are accessible restrooms or adequate braille signage. Fortunately, the passage last year of the Great American Outdoors Act gave the National Park Service and land management agencies much needed funding to modernize their infrastructure and make sure they meet requirements like those in the Americans with Disabilities Act. But people with disabilities face barriers to access beyond physical infrastructure. They may have a hard time finding specific information about trails that could be too steep or rocky for their assistive devices. 
Like most people, without lots of experience, they may be intimidated by the idea of going into the wilderness without a guide who understands their specific needs. Put more simply, the needs of people with disabilities in accessing the outdoors are as varied and unique as the people themselves. That's why I'm so grateful to our witnesses who will share their personal and professional experiences in the outdoors. Listening to the voices of people with different backgrounds and perspectives is the best way for Congress to build back inclusively. Although there is no one size fits all solution to this issue, one thing is clear. We can make our parks and public lands more accessible without breaking the bank or sacrificing conservation goals. In fact, as we are about to hear, many of the things that make, the out, make outdoor recreation more sustainable also make it more accessible. I want to thank our witnesses again for taking the time to be here. We look forward to your testimony. The chair now recognizes the ranking minority member, Mr. Gozar, for any statement. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and congratulations on your first hearing as chair of the prestigious oversight and investigations subcommittee. This subcommittee has a proven commitment to oversight over the Department of Interior and has worked well in a bipartisan fashion over oversight of important issues facing our public lands. I know you have a reputation as an aggressive oversight champion, and I look forward to working with you to employ those skills to closely examine the Biden administration's policies, which seek to radically tighten the government's grip on our federal lands. I hope your historic enthusiasm of aggressive oversight reflects an honest commitment to good government and not simply a partisan ploy for political points. However, as we begin our first hearing, I will confess I'm deeply disappointed that while we're holding a hearing on the department's actions, we have no witness here to present the administration's views. Just last week, the Energy and Minerals Resource Subcommittee on which we are both members successfully invited an administration witness to answer questions from Congress. Yet today, apparently the subcommittee doesn't consider this issue important enough to do the same. Access to our federal lands is one of the most important issues regarding federal lands management and I have appreciated the opportunity to get answers from the administration. The American people and our witnesses deserve these answers. I urge you to invite the administration to future hearings on important issues. Back to access. Frequently when faced with access challenges, federal land managers default to allowing less access to our federal lands. For people with disabilities, an overwhelming majority of our national parks are only accessible to the visitor center. If these visitors are lucky, they will find an occasional accessible bathroom. This is unacceptable. Instead, we should open more lands and increase accessibility for people with mo mobility challenges. The Trump administration made this a priority through Secretarial Order 3376, clarifying the ongoing management confusion surrounding the operation of electric bikes on federal lands. In that order, then Secretary Bernhardt made significant strides advancing recreational opportunities for all Americans especially those with physical limitations, and provided more opportunities to encourage the enjoyment of lands and waters managed by the department. To build upon that important order, I hope witnesses will share ideas about expanding opportunities on federal lands. Our overreaching goal should be to ensure improved and equal access to federal lands for people with disabilities and the general public. This means we need projects advanced by land management agencies to include handicapped access of nature and educational trails, bird and wildlife viewings, platforms, safe, accessible piers for boating and fishing opportunities, wheelchair ramps for improved access, and allowing more use of specialized equipment and facilities for access to our federal lands. We also need a deeper discussion about the opportunities electric mobility uh, presents for more access to our federal lands. As the Secretarial Order on eBytes made clear, there is confusion about these new technologies among our land managers. One question which I hope can be answered today is if Congress needs to revisit the Wilderness Act to clarify the use of e-mobility options. Uh, Congress has reaffirmed that nothing in the Wilderness Act prohibits the use of wheelchairs in a wilderness area, though it offers no practical allowances for wheelchairs use whatsoever. We may need to include that option to engage in the new e-mobility opportunities. The promotion of quiet technology at the Grand Canyon is a perfect example, which allowed a significant expansion of visitation to the park while protecting the visitor experience. Enhanced e-mobility solutions on federal lands can result in similar wins for visitors and access. Finally, Madam Chair, at the same time we're here we're discussing accessibility to our federal lands, this administration is proposing one of the largest closures of our federal lands ever considered, 
And again, we don't have a witness from the administration here to discuss those plans. While we are here working to expand access, the administration is plowing straight ahead with their radical plan to restrict access to 30% of America. It isn't enough that our federal lands are already the most protected properties on the globe, but the Biden administration is finding new ways to undermine local communities, circumvent the multiple use mandate and lock up more land. That effort shows a radical environmentalism that displays a dangerous thoughtlessness to closing communities like mine that will be most impacted. Again, Madam Chair, congratulations. I look forward to working with you in this Congress to conduct the important oversight and to lead critical investigations that we need to hold the administration accountable. And with that, I yield back. Thank you very much. The chair now recognizes the chairman of the Natural Resources Committee, Chairman Grohalva, for any opening remarks he'd wish to make. Very simply, uh, Madam Chair, to uh, thank you for the hearing and to welcome you to your role as chair of this very important committee. And um, the questions I have, I'll wait till the witnesses are done. And thank you very much for the courtesy. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I would now recognize um, Mr. Westerman for um, the ranking member of the full committee on House Natural Resources for any opening remarks he would like to add. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Chair Grahal and Ranking Member Gosar. Uh, I'm just elated that we're having a hearing on access. This is something that I hear a lot about in my district. Um, we should be having a lot of hearings on access, and I'm glad that the majority is finally uh, looking at this important issue. It's one of the biggest things I hear about in my district is people want more access to the federal lands uh, that we have there. It's not just people with handicaps. It's all people want access to the lands. Hardworking American taxpayers feel like they deserve to have access to the lands uh, that the country owns. And we should be working on not just access for people with handicaps. We should especially work on access for them uh, so that they can enjoy public lands. But all Americans want to enjoy the public lands that we have. We should not be locking up public lands in wilderness areas and putting further restrictions out there uh, so that American taxpayers can experience the outdoors and the lands that we all own. So I'm glad we're having a hearing on access. It kind of shocked me when that came up. Uh, I know it's specifically for access for folks with handicaps, which again, we need to really work on that. Not only people uh, who uh, are, are handicapped, but a lot of the constituents I have that are elder, elderly, uh, that they can't, uh, they can't walk into an area. They need to have other forms of access to get into, uh, whether it's fish and wildlife areas or uh, forest service areas, or even to national park areas. Uh, we need to make sure that all Americans have access. Look forward to hearing the witnesses and I yield back. The chair thanks Mr. Westerman for his comments and looks forward to working across the aisle on this issue. Without objection, the member from Alaska, Representative Donald Young, is going to be authorized to question the witnesses in today's hearing. Um, I now want to introduce the witnesses. Um, our first witness will be Ms. Amy Bowen. She is a U.S. Army veteran who served tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. Then we will hear from Ms. Julie Edmondson. She is the Associate Executive Director of Wilderness Inquiry. To introduce our third witness, the chair would like to recognize Mr. Young um, to introduce Mr. Hill. You are muted. If you could unmute, we'd love to hear from you. My, hang on. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Can you we hear can me? We can hear you. Yes, sir. Hi. Hi. I'm sorry, guys. I told you I wasn't good at this thing. Anyway, Madam Chair, everybody's thanking you. I thank you. This issue of access has been dear to my heart. We just tossed the, the Great American Land Act last year with Miss Dingle, and we did a lot of good work in there. But I, uh, I'm proud of the fact that I got Graham Hill is uh, going to be testifying. Graham and I. Are Old friends used to be staffer, hunted together in a wheelchair, uh, outstanding shot, and he knows the ability of the the need for accessibility. And I, I this is not a partisan issue. This is across the board. 
I really believe we ought to make sure that those less fortunate can do the things they can do. Graham's been very good at this. I can give you good testimony of what's needed. And I'm, I'm very excited about hearing this program. I'm will, I am going to leave you guys. I know it's going to break your heart, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Huffman. We have to leave you at eight, uh, 1230 uh, your time, 830 mine. I have another hearing I have to attend via Zoom. But thank you, Madam Chair, for the work you're doing. And thank you, Graham, for being there. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Young. You're welcome to come back if you have the time. We appreciate your joining us today. Our fourth witness will be Mr. Mike Passo. He is the Executive Director of American Trails. I want to remind the witnesses that under our committee rules, they must limit their oral statements to five minutes, but their entire statement will appear in the hearing record. When you begin, the timer will begin, and it will turn orange when you have one minute remaining. I recommend that members and witnesses joining remotely use the stage view so that they can pin the timer to their screen. After your testimony is complete, please remember to mute yourself to avoid any inadvertent background noise. I will ask the entire I will um, ask the entire panel to testify before any questioning of the witnesses. And with that, the chair now recognizes Ms. Amy Bowen to give her testimony. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Porter and members of the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee. Um, my first camping experience was as a college Army ROTC cadet four months after September 11th. I was in Fort Lewis, Washington during a freezing wet night, pulling security with a pretend rubber and 16 a 2 rifle and questioning my life choices. This is not what I thought camping was supposed to be. While I felt deathly cold that January night, I toughened over the next decade and lived up to a, lived up to being a third generation Army veteran. I entered the Army in 2005 as a registered nurse at Walter Reed Army Medical Center, taking care of my peers coming home from Iraq and Afghanistan until I had the opportunity to deploy in Iraq in 2008 and run a clinic for American troops. After Iraq, I transitioned to become a civil affairs officer. officer a job under the United States Army Special Operations. At that point, my experiences outdoor were more hate than love, but I grew confident with each challenge, survival school, hot days at airborne school, long days in North Carolina humidity, carrying a lot of equipment, bugs, and more long days in the mountains of Georgia with more humidity. As I was growing to know what I could do myself, I pushed the boundaries of what people could expect from me as a soldier and began to enjoy the outdoors. I deployed in 2013 to a remote outpost in Afghanistan, surrounded by the Hin beautiful Hindu Kush mountains. I became the only woman on the outpost after a few months in, not feeling isolated until a man attempted to sexually assault me. I decided to leave the Army when I returned home in 2014, and at that point I had severe back and hip problems related to the parachuting and carrying heavy loads during training and deployment, and my mental health struggled as I came to terms with what happened in Afghanistan. I went from being an elite, elite level athlete with a promising military career to a person who felt completely hollow and uncertain of her future. I struggled my first three years as, civil as a civilian. I didn't fit in with most male dominated veteran groups and I was re-traumatized every <laughs> appointment at the VA where I was being sexually harassed to go see the doctor, which one in four women apparently experienced according to the Disabled American Veterans Group. I also didn't fit in with civilian women either, so I shelled up and moved close to the mountains because that's all I knew that made me happy. Shortly after moving out west to Colorado, I focused on trail running and began rock climbing. For the first time, I chose my own outdoor adventures and escaped into the mountains. Getting to spend time with my thoughts and challenge myself in America's most natural landscape made me feel glad to be finally at home in the United States and at peace. For instance, as a climber in the Californian Sierras, I avoid inefficient physiological responses to fear through deep breathing and thinking through logic and not emotion. And this translates day to day in my everyday life. Some in the health community doubt the therapeutic of therapeutic benefits of outdoor recreation, but I'm not here to testify that outdoor therapy is a substitute for good VA healthcare. This is about autonomy and being able to believe that the best days aren't behind you and not being part of a broken veteran stereotype. 
It's about allowing yourself to have comfort and discomfort again, so you can overcome adversity and strengthen your self-confidence. For example, stepping off in the mountain air with a headlamp at 4 a.m. to some at 14,000 foot mountain is not comfortable, but through managing risk and pushing my comfort zone, I accomplish goals I set for myself for what I'm still able to do with what I have. I realize I missed the discomfort challenge and earn my self-fulfillment in these types of situations from the Army. Now I'm doing it under my own terms and thriving in these beautiful places. Of note, some of the most accessible park sites are also the most popular, relying on lotteries and reservation battles online. Improvements can be made with this process. Socially, Sebastian Younger describes our inclination as human beings to be part of a group with purpose and understanding in this book, Tribe. Many veterans struggle with the transition back home because they lost their tribe in the military, but complicate that one step more for women who often have their service questioned by other veterans or are re-traumatized during their VA visit. Motivated by safely gaining access in the backcountry and a much needed climbing partner, I found my community of people with purpose, shared passion for the outdoors at the American Alpine Club. I was the only veteran, veteran there in it, only veteran there forcing me to get over the discomfort of social transition. Having a disability layer in life should not be the end of an individual's dignity. I'm grateful that the outdoor therapy fills gaps in the VA system. Um, my barrier to entry was a bit steep as a minority woman vet, um, but I'm lucky for my boyfriend who mentored me and my mentor, John Krakauer, through the Tillman Foundation. I asked for the oversight to com committee to not leave these benefits up to chance so that all disabled veterans have the equal opportunity to benefit from access to public lands in an equitable way. Under the Trump administration, the Compact Act passed a report on the usage of public lands for the national for the medical treatment and therapy of veterans. I thank the committee for taking interest, and I'm glad the Biden administration is giving us additional opportunities by protecting 30% of our lands and waters by 2030. I ask both parties to work together for a veteran's outdoor access. I know I'm running over in time, so I'm gonna cut the end of this really short. All I ask is, <laughs> that as the oversight committee ask the people, I ask that people like me are not an afterthought with public lands and are included along the way. Um, 10 years ago, I prepared for war outside on large military training areas, but now I'm training for the rest of my life on public lands. Thank you very much, Ms. Bowen. The chair now recognizes Ms. Julie Edmondson to testify. Thank you, Chair Porter, Ranking Member Gosar, members of the SUM Committee, and thank you, Ms. Bowen, for your testimony and service as well. I'm Julia Emiston, the Associate Executive Director of Wilderness Inquiry. I'm also a former trip guide for individuals of diverse abilities from Yellowstone to the Apostle Islands, a former teacher for students who are deaf and hard of hearing, and a parent of a child with a disability. Wilderness Inquiry is a 501c3 nonprofit organization headquartered in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And our mission is to connect people of all ages, backgrounds, and abilities to each other and the natural world through shared outdoor adventures. We believe that anyone can participate in and enjoy the outdoors. And we have shown that it is possible for the outdoors to be accessible for everyone across our more than 40 years. Wilderness Inquiry began with the challenge to show that people with disabilities could experience the Boundary Waters Canoe Area. And we have grown to serve more than 40,000 people each year all across the country, including nearly 5,000 people annually with a disability. Every American should have the right to experience our national parks, national forests, and public lands. Yet the ability to access those quintessentially American experiences isn't created equal for everyone. Core to our mission at Wilderness Inquiry is a commitment to supporting outdoor connection for people of all abilities. Our programs make that possible from providing trips with highly trained staff, to adaptive gear and equipment, to working in close partnership with federal land management agencies and people in the disability community to build bridges that support outdoor access for all. I wanna share a quote from a Wilderness Inquiry participant. Janet is from the Milwaukee area and has traveled with us to Canyonlands National Park, the Grand Canyon, and the Apostle Islands, among others. She also uses a wheelchair. As a person with a disability, I am aware of barriers to inclusion and always devising strategies to experience life, my community, and all of its offerings in a manner similar to my peers, but unique to my individuality. The Wilderness Inquiry trips I've participated in have always provided me through an inclusive mission, a renewed optimism, a greater vision for myself, and a confirmation of the inherent kindness of others. While I generally don't lack in confidence, there are times when the barriers to fully experiencing the natural wonders of our country are daunting. 
I know that my world experience does not need to be narrowed because of my disability, but can be as expansive as my spirit and sense of wonder allows. I truly believe the branches of my life's path would not be what they turned out to be without the positive reaffirming influences of the wilderness inquiry trips I participated in." End quote. Janet is one of thousands of people who have traveled with us, but this helps to show what is possible when we work together to break down barriers to access in the outdoors. The outdoors is a perfect platform for us to come together and experience our common humanity. We are no longer Julie who travels by foot and Janet who travels by wheels, or Jen who communicates with sign language or Bob who uses a talking board. We are travel companions, we are outdoor adventurers, we are people. I also think it's important for this committee to know how vital the role of the federal government is in providing and ensuring equitable outdoor access and working through public and private partnerships to bring that to every corner of this country. We cannot do this work alone. And at Wilderness Inquiry, we work closely with land management agencies. Cooperative agreements that designate funding to fill in gaps that can be challenging for any one agency to do on their own make a huge difference in connecting individuals with disabilities to their public lands. And many public lands do have some incredible accessibility features, but people don't always know that. Parks can offer accessibility manuals, but if people don't know they exist or can't find them, it can be daunting to navigate our public lands. Organizations like Wilderness Inquiry can play a critical role in making those connections, and we have appreciated support from the National Park Service, USDA Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and others. A recent appropriation through the USDA Forest Service Urban Connections Program is a perfect example of the power of the land management agencies to build capacity and connection to the outdoors. And it's a model for building strong relationships with youth, interested citizens, urban leaders, interagency partners, and non-government organizations. This appropriation also includes specific language for including youth with disabilities, an important step to ensuring the funding invests in equal access. Federal agreements and appropriations can also help leverage funding and partnership from the private sector to extend our reach and impact. We are aware of public agencies working across sectors to improve trails, provide increased lighting for better communication, update websites so people can make informed decisions, and offer trainings to better serve individuals of all abilities. And together, we can do more. So as I end my testimony today, I want to thank you for your leadership. You can and do play a critical role in shaping the federal landscape around access to the outdoors for people with disabilities. I also want to ask for your continued support for the federal agencies that work directly with communities across the country to create opportunities for people with disabilities and all people to access our nation's public lands, parks, and forests. A Wilderness Inquiry, our core belief is that everyone belongs. Your leadership is essential in making that possible and showing that every American can access, experience, and belong in the outdoors. So thank you to Porter, Ranking Member Gosar, and members of the subcommittee. We're grateful for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Ms. Edmondson. The chair now recognizes Mr. Hill to testify. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman and members of the committee. And uh, I wanna thank uh, Chairman Young, uh, who I think has his video turned off for that generous introduction. He and I uh, go way back and he's one of my heroes there. We've hunted and fished all over creation together. Um, and I know that he does care about exactly what he said he did access. Um, I come to you by way of 40 years of hunting and fishing in a wheelchair. I'm actually from Texas, grew up there. And what some people may not realize is that a real core of the disability uh, community seeking access, seeking more activities actually were located in Texas. Uh, folks like Shorty Powers, who established the paraplegics on independent nature trips. 42 years ago uh, was someone that I, uh, when I was first injured, started working with and going out with. Uh, people like Bob Kafka, Randy Snow, uh, Justin Dart, titans of the disability access world came from Texas. And we all lived there together and worked on these issues going back four decades. And most of the issues that we confront today are similar, if not identical, to what we struggled with 40 years ago before we had the increase in the number of disabled uh, uh, outdoorsmen and women from the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, etc. Uh, Camp uh, Hope for the Warriors, Rivers of Recovery, Wilderness Inquiry, uh, Camp Freedom, there are hundreds of volunteer organizations out there that try and help the disabled get onto federal lands uh, and outdoors for its healing qualities. There's a reason that a lot of these out, uh, volunteer organizations focus on the outdoors. 
as I said in my testimony, the healing qualities, the, the capacity of the outdoors to bring a person back to center, to help them find their ways, restore them, is unquestioned. And that's why all of us, at least in my 40 years of, of these pursuits, have continued to seek the outdoors. And that's why these other witnesses have said what they've said. It's real. Uh, the ADA in 1990 uh, was a big step for all of us in the disabled community towards better access. But one of the problems with the ADA is that it, it was intended to establish a floor for accessibility, but it inadvertently established a ceiling. And what we've seen is a lot of folks will do things that get them just to the level of compliance with the ADA, and then they stop. And I dare say that that perception, that approach to what the ADA intended is prevalent throughout our land agencies. Uh, I've noted in my testimony the conflict between Section 507A of the ADA and the Wilderness Act. I was actually in the gallery and watching the debate in 1998 with my good friend, Chairman Young, uh, and later to be chair of resource, this committee, Mr. Hansen and Mr. Schaefer and a ranking Miller, a member Miller, as that debate uh, went forth. And while that bill passed and the study occurred, we are still at basically the same spot that we were at then in terms of wilderness area access. Um, the, AD, the Wilderness Act and the ADA are reconcilable. Uh, there is plenty of room in the middle for wheelchair access and other disabled access on wilderness areas. It's just a question of willpower. That's it. Um, in terms of the other land agencies, I think the National Park Service and the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service have made more progress in this area, in my experience, than the Forest Service and BLM. Uh, the activity restrictions that you see on NPS uh, and the Forest Service are one reason why they have a little bit less uh, push going on from uh, users to customers, as I say. The, uh, we are still working with BLM and Forest Service to establish recreational policies for all uh, users, not just the disabled, but able-bodied as well. Uh, that reluctance, the resistance, that's there by unit managers and facility managers and others in part flows from the shortcomings of the ADA, but it also flows from a concern that they are going to step into a Pandora's box of problems and without direction from Congress or at the secretarial level, they're just not gonna make the further progress that we need to see. Let me briefly also agree with a saliency I saw in the other witnesses' testimonies that the amount of uh, information available specifically designed for the disabled is really sad. Recreation.gov, which was a terrific idea, we've supported it at the HHSSC quite a bit and at the NCD, but if you go there and try to find a single one-shop stop for accessibility, there just isn't one. So that's a huge area of improvement along with more outreach with some of the volunteer organizations. I'll stop my testimony there and I look forward to questions from members of the committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hill. The chair now recognizes Mr. Paso for his testimony. Thank you and good afternoon, Chair Porter and Ranking Member Gosar and members of the subcommittee. I'm here to talk to you today on behalf of American Trails and the Trails Move People Coalition. I thank the committee for the opportunity to provide testimony on the importance of providing accessible outdoor recreation opportunities on our nation's public lands to all people, irrespective of geography, mode of recreation, socioeconomic status, or experience. I'm a person with a disability. I, I've, uh, I broke my back about 30 years ago mountain biking. And I'm also here representing American Trails. Um, and our group strive to elevate and prioritize trails by developing funding and research resources so that everyone will have access to more and better trail opportunities and in turn, more fulfilling personal experiences outside. As I'm sure you've all seen, the demand for outdoor recreation on federal lands has increased dramatically over the last 30 years. It is expected to continue to rise and the COVID-19 pandemic is a only brought that into a more dramatic focus as trails and public land use across the country are seeing 200, 400 percent increases by Americans seeking that respite of being outdoors. Um, 
Yet for a multitude of complex reasons, the majority of Americans, including people with disabilities, do not participate in outdoor recreation. And I think there's a, there's a few reasons for that. Um, some of the obstacles to access to public lands in my opinion, the biggest and the, the most dramatic is lack of information, like my colleague, Mr. Hill, just mentioned. Um, disability is a spectrum, and no people experience it in the same way. So, But providing objective details about a, what a person can expect when they venture into the outdoors, every person can de then decide for themselves whether a trail or outdoor recreation experience meets with their own personal requirements. In this way, I, I'd say without even touching a shovel or a mini excavator, um, you can improve trail accessibility and facility accessibility by 80% just by simply letting people know what, their experience, what the experience they're going to have is and whether it meets with their needs. And there are several resources out there right now on the federal, in the federal realm. One of them that I, I actually recently found out about is the USGS has a national digital trails um, project and they're gathering trail data from across the country. They have, um, I think, 280,000 miles of trails in there right now. None of it really currently includes, well, I shouldn't say none. It's not consistently inclusive of recreation or of accessibility information, but it could be. And that would be a great resource to really focus trail accessibility information. Um, my colleague, Mr. Hill, also recommended recreation.gov, which is a really great source for, for recreation information, uh, but it doesn't have accessibility information. So a great step would be to try and develop some of that information. Other, other you know, big um, obstacles come from the, the land manager side of the worry about setting precedent um, for creating special programs for pe people with disabilities, opening floodgates to special requests. Um, there's an issue with allocation of resources that um, it's accessibility to people with disabilities not prioritized uh, by land managers. And it's often pigeonholed as simply another special need with a minor, minor constituency. Um, and then there's the worry of, of disability access being used as a, as a tool for repealing environmental protections um, like, like the wilderness issues. And all of these issues need to be addressed on, on the land manager side. Um, there's also, I've, I've really found in my 30 years of being in a wheelchair and, and working on universal accessibility that there's really no difference between an accessible trail and a sustainable trail. The grades shouldn't be more than 10%. Uh, cross slopes and widths should be at least 32 inches. Surfaces should be firm and stable and obstacles less than two inches. And that works for everybody. That improves everybody's access. Um, so based on some of these recommendations, I have a few recommendations for the, for the committee. Um, I'd love to encourage um, currently, there's, there's trail and outdoor um, guidelines for federal lands is under the ABA, but it's not in the ADA. Um, ADA guidelines are essentially have to be kicked back to the built environment, and that doesn't work, and it causes confusion on state and local levels. Um, we should teach or we should do trainings for staff to get baseline assessments of, of information and then provide those resources to the public on websites. I think one really critical easy step would be an accessibility tab on every um, federal land management agency website. Um, so I'm, I'm realizing I'm out of time, but I'm going to simply um, um, sum up here by simply saying that there's no greater statement of social acceptance than being asked to recreate together as a friend, a peer, and a colleague. And when people enjoy each other enough to extend the invitation to re recreate together, that usually means there's a great step in, in improving accessibility. So I thank you, Chair Porter and Ranking Member Gosar and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify. I'd be eager to answer any questions. Thanks. I thank the panel for their testimony, reminding the members that Committee Rule 3D imposes a five minute limit on questions the chair will now recognize members for any questions they wish to
to ask the witnesses. I would like to begin by recognizing Chair Grijalva for his questioning. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And, and uh, you know, last, last Congress, uh, we held the hearings on issues of diversity, equity, inclusion in our public lands and uh, and the environmental movement in general. But uh, and and those issues de dealt with workforce. They de dealt with interpretation. They dealt with visitor participation and access. And and uh, one of the reasons of that was uh, that all visitors from different backgrounds uh, feel welcome and visit and enjoy the public lands. That was the premise for that hearing and to address those shortfalls. But so I'm glad this hearing that you're having today is because we sometimes forget uh, that when we talk about diversity, we're also talking about tens of millions of Americans who have a disability. And, uh, and we need to do a much better job of not only listening to them, but acting on some of the most, uh, some of the recommendations today and, and others that are gonna be forthcoming. Uh, Mr. Paso, if I may, just a, a quick uh, question. You talked about the information gap that, that needs to be filled in terms of making sure that persons with disabilities and those wishing uh, willing uh, wishing to access our, our public lands have the information. So to address that gap. Uh, the training, you, what, what kind of training? You mentioned that also would help uh, federal land managers better meet the needs of people of people with disabilities and, and make that whole experience more inclusive in our parks. Thank you for that question, Chairman Grijalva. Um, yeah, I think there's a great great opportunity for um, for training. Um, I, I specifically think How much time do I have? there's there's a need for um, for prioritization amongst the the leaders of the the federal agencies, so they need to express to their staff and provide them the resources to be able to prioritize accessibility because it does it's it's something that every person in America at some point or another is going to run across being having a disabling condition of some kind um, and there are there's assessment techniques that can be done for trails and outdoor developed areas that um, you know they could train their maintenance staff while they're doing their their standard everyday job they could be collecting really basic accessibility information while they're doing that like what's the maximum grade of the trail that you're brushing out or what's the surface type of the trail you're using and those types of basic training could be brought back to the office and then provided to the public in very simple ways yeah and, and let me if i may mr Puzzle, one just a quick question on, on, on another comment that you made toward the end of your of your uh, statement with having to do with precedent that many times uh uh, as as the access issue with persons for disability is being addressed, that the question of precedent becomes an issue, and 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 the experience of perhaps uh, land managers and 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 other people, uh, myself included, or sometimes experiences that leap, that leap from from the special use need to create access for persons with disability and the leap to uh, dismantling parts of the Wilderness Act um, regarding full motorization of access into those areas. How do you deal with, with that leap, number one, and number two, the issue of the precedent that you brought up, and then uh, thank you. Yeah, I would say um, that that's a huge issue, and it's been around for, it's been around yes. since the 80s. Yep. Um, and there's, you know, we did, we've, I've been a part of a multitude of studies of people with disabilities. And I think uh, Graham Hill mentioned the, the people with disabilities in the wilderness uh, uh, study. And one of the elements of that study that came about was, you know, they found that, that 76% of the people that you, that have disabilities, um, 
do not believe that restrictions on mechanized use in wilderness diminish their ability to enjoy the wilderness. The people, it, it appears that people with disabilities appear to visit, visit the wilderness system in the same way and for the same reason that people with disabilities. And, you know, there are still many ways that you can improve those trails in wilderness areas without requiring mechanized use. You know, you could widen them slightly to provide better access all across the board and, and, and provide more stable surfaces and things like that. Thank you. Yield back, Madam Chair, and thank you very much for this uh, oversight hearing uh, and uh, look forward to uh, your recommendations and the, and the committee, subcommittee's recommendations on, on this area. It's very important. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The chair now recognizes Mr. Gosar, the gentleman from Arizona, the ranking subcommittee member. Thank you, Chairwoman. I'd like to begin my question period by sharing the personal story of one of our nation's veterans who was wounded in combat and lives with a permanent disability. Would you please play Drew's clip? Hello, my name is Drew Gowen. I'm a husband, father, teacher, football coach, combat wounded veteran, and hunter. In 2008, while on routine patrol in Iraq, I was struck in the face with a roadside bomb. This explosion left me permanently blind in my left eye with several metal plates in my face. In the time since my injury, hunting has been a great tool for my success and recovery. However, it is difficult to find information on access to public lands. I cannot find the information related to where to hunt, when I can hunt, how to access these lands and put in spots for the woods. Due to my vision loss, it is important for me to use trails that are distinct, clearly marked and easily accessible. Two years ago, I was walking through the woods on public lands while hiking. A tree branch was hanging in the path and I was unable to see it due to my vision loss. This branch struck me directly in my only eye with vision and scratched and bruised the area surrounding my eye. I was extremely lucky to retain vision after that incident. Hunting is extremely important to me because of the benefit it has on my mental health. Hunting requires focus, dedication, a calm demeanor, and patience as we work the steps that it takes to harvest an animal. Two summers ago, I became involved with Wild Ox. This organization allows veterans to hunt, fish, and experience the outdoors in ways that are both peaceful and challenging while in a controlled environment. My trip took me to Montana where I learned to fly fish in the most beautiful and pristine lands that I have ever witnessed. That experience changed my life in many ways. Access to public, uh, public hunting lands is extremely important for veterans and will be beneficial to the continued process of healing for our veterans. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Drew. Uh, Mr. Hill, thank you for joining us today. In the testimony you just heard, Drew described the impact of his trip to Montana made possible through a private organization. Can you explain the benefit that partnerships between land management agencies and private groups provide to people with disabilities, particularly our veterans? Yes, sir. The benefits are uh, extraordinary. There's a lot of private groups out there. They're well-funded, they're well-organized, and the volunteers, the people that run them, earnestly deeply care about helping the disabled experience just what you heard the healing power of the outdoors and the resources the manpower the aids to accessibility that they can bring to a disabled person are frankly just beyond the resources or capabilities of unit managers or facility managers within the land agencies there is a fair amount of partnering that occurs today but I think the consistency of direction from the top of the department that encourages those partnerships and a clear understanding by the unit managers and facility managers about what they can do without getting into trouble would help encourage more collaboration. You answered my second question. So now not, not only is information about access important as shown by Drew's testimony, it is crucial that land managers have the flexibility to provide different types of accommodations for people with disabilities who want to visit our federal lands. In your testimony, you note the need to make practical progress when addressing accessibility issues. 
In your opinion, how can we best equip our federal land managers to accommodate new technologies like e-bikes, which increase access for individuals facing mobility challenges? Well, I, uh, I really like the secretarial order on e-bikes because it is an example of how secretary level direction can clarify a longstanding barrier to the use of a device like that for the disabled. Uh, it was easy to recognize. It just was the question of the willpower of going in and establishing an order that made it clear. As far as the unit managers and facility managers go, having a consistent policy within a land agency that the unit managers understand and understand what accommodations they can make would be a huge step. I would point out that in 1992, the National Council on Disability made that precise recommendation concerning wilderness areas under the authority of the four land agencies that a consistent policy and training on what it means would uh, ameliorate barriers. And that today is still a pertinent recommendation. It still has not happened with the consistency and the comfort level at the unit manager level to go out and do things. They're afraid if I accommodate Mike or Graham or someone else, then they're going to have all kinds of precedent problems. Uh, so they don't do it. They pull back. So one last question. So uh, you noted in your uh, uh, testimony that the uh, Park Service and the Fish and Wildlife Services have taken big strides. Can you provide, can provide some of those examples of, for, of positive changes? And second, could you, uh, in your opinion, could the Forest Service and BLM implement similar measures to achieve that same practical accessibility? Yes, sir. So the Park Service, in part because of the lack of certain activities that are eligible on their facilities, have a smaller galaxy of activities they need to accommodate for the disabled. But because of their revenue, their staffing, and their intra-agency working group on disability access, in my opinion, they have done the best job. They also have more consistent categories of visitors, uh, and they have engaged in that. And they've, I've seen constant improvement there. Fish and Wildlife Service has done a good job, in my view, also through an intra-agency perspective on this. The annual hunt rule that comes out that governs the hunting on all of their facilities uh, has consistently reflected accommodations that state law makes for disabled, including methods of take, et cetera. That's been very productive. Those two process examples of consistent policy and, and priority within the agency and familiarity at it with it at the facility level is what BLM could benefit from. BLM, for example, we've been struggling for 14 years for BLM to have a consistent recreational shooting policy for anybody across their facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're still struggling to get that accomplished today. And, and the Forest Service, because of their mission under USDA, frankly, the access issue for the disabled just hasn't been a priority there. They've got so many of irons in the fire with uh, their forest management issues. They just haven't made this a priority yet. Thank you, Mr. Hill, and thank the chairwoman for her indulgence, and uh, thank you very much for playing that clip. I yield back. Thank you very much. Um, the chair now recognizes herself to um, ask questions. I think most people understand that going on a hike or planning a camping trip requires planning, but there are added challenges for planning for people with disabilities. But I think a lot of us couldn't tell you what those challenges are, so that's where I wanted to start. Um, Mr. Paso, you shared with me before the hearing some of your own experiences as a person with paraplegia, and I'm very grateful for that. If you don't mind, I wanted to talk through what it would be like for someone who uses a wheelchair and is relatively new to camping and hiking to book a campground and plan a day hike in a national park. What is the first thing you would need to know? Well, I... I think um, deciding where to go is the, the biggest challenge. Um, there's just, you know, everybody wants to go to the big five national parks, but there's so many wonderful places out there. But, you know, the I, I agree with, with my colleague, Mr. Hill, that, you know, the Park Service especially has done a really great job of improving access. So that, that becomes a much better option. 
Um, but even then, if you go to, you know, uh, even a smaller national park or, or even one of the big ones, it's really hard to find accessibility information that's pertinent to you. So you, you're taking a roll of the dice a little bit. You can, you can explore the, the photos of trails, you can explore the photos of the centers, and you can get little hints about you know, how steep they seem to be or how wide they seem to be, and then you have to roll the dice and, and decide to go. And then once you go, you have to ensure that they have accessible campsites and that somebody isn't already in their accessible campsite that they have. And usually when you find an accessible campsite, all it has is the wheelchair symbol on it. It doesn't have any information about, you know, how how steep the trail to the bathroom is or, you know, whether the picnic table has a place for a wheelchair to sit at or whether the fire pit is tall enough to build a fire. Um, so there's a lot of missing information and, you, and you're taking it uh, upon yourself by exploring some of those pictures to figure out what could happen. And for people, you mentioned that a lot of times you, you have to look at some photos and then go and do your best when you're on the ground. Um, would it be helpful to have that information on recreation.gov? And to what extent does it exist today? Um, I think it'd be extreme, extremely helpful and I was, I was wondering that myself. I went and explored rec.gov before this call because I figured that question would come up and there's very little information on there. You can you can go into some of the registration systems and find those ubiquitous little blue wheelchair symbols, but they, those don't always tell you exactly what you need to know. And, and there's nothing about trails, essentially. There are a few, uh, websites like Beneficial Designs runs the Trail Explorer website, which is all of the trails that they have assessed for accessibility and universal design characteristics. But that's very hit or miss. It depends on where they've had a contract. And there's others like Accessible, the uh, Accessible Trail Foundation in Nevada and other small organizations. But there's no consistent place to find that information. And when there is basic information, it's often the very, very basic information that uh, will not let you as a person with a disability necessarily find out whether that meets your needs or not versus, um, you know, uh, another person that has a different type of a disability. It's, it's all just one set of information. Um, so I think, you know, one of the things that you raised that I think is really important is that giving people the detailed information lets people with different kinds of abilities and different kinds of disabilities choose what's at their capability level. So rather than have this binary wheelchair, no wheelchair, people need a whole range of information to accommodate the whole range of different abilities. This seems like this information problem with both sides of the aisle and, and both all kinds of witnesses have raised seems like a fixable problem to me. Taxpayers are giving Booz Allen Hamilton, one of the biggest consulting firms in the world, $182 million to operate recreation.gov. And for $182 million, I would hope that they could create a website that provides more information to people with disabilities so that they could have what they need. Um, and this is not unique um, to our conversation. Um, the single biggest barrier for public land access period for all people is the lack of good information and the ability to plan and make decisions, including making sure these websites are accessible for those who are blind um, and have other kinds of impairments. So I think it's long past time that changes. Um, the chair now recognizes Mr. Heist, the gentleman from Georgia for his questioning. Thank you, Chairwoman Porter. I appreciate that very much. And before asking my questions, I would uh, like to share the uh, experience of Rob Jones, who is a Marine Corps veteran. He's a double amputee from combat injuries that he sustained in Afghanistan. So if we could please uh, roll his uh, video testimony. Hi, my name is Rob Jones, and I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to speak with you about people with disabilities having access to public lands. Uh, I'm a retired U.S. Marine, and what you can't see from this video is that I'm a double above the amputee as a result of an IED blast. And before my injury, I, I used to love going out into the woods and hiking. I still do. Um, 
And I'd like to illustrate my points by telling you a story about going to Hawaii with my family. Uh, we went, we wanted to see all sorts of, you know, sights, uh, scenic views. And so we went to this one uh, volcanic island uh, park and there was supposed to be a lot of good hiking trails that we wanted to go on. And the first one we went on was nice and wide and it was, uh, it was mostly wooden plank. So it was great for me. It was, it was fun. It was easy. We saw a bunch of sulfur springs and all sorts of things like that. Um, but when we got to the second trail that we wanted to go on, which is the one I was actually more excited about because it took you by all sorts of, you know, you could, there was a chance you could see lava from, from the trail. And when we got there, it had been eroded so much from people walking on it and from rainfall that there was just this gully in the middle of the trail. And me with my, my short legs that I figured would probably be good with the limited information that was available, I, I figured I could do it, but it was so difficult. To, I, could, I just couldn't stand anywhere. And so it took me like, it took like two and a half hours to hike maybe a mile and a half of this trail. And by the end of it, I was so irritated and embarrassed and irate uh, with how it went that I just I just wanted to go home. It just kind of ruined the entire experience for me. And it also made me feel terrible because my, my entire family was like waiting for me the entire time. And yeah, it just kind of ruined, ruined the day for me, to be honest with you. And so this kind of illustrates to you, I hope, uh, in the limited time available that you know, with a little bit of more information, I have access to all sorts of prosthetic legs and devices and things like that. But so maybe with a little bit more information about the trail, I might have been able to have a better prosthetic solution. And mm -hmm. also keep in mind that there's a lot of people that don't have the access to the equipment that I have. So the ability to build better infrastructure for people to uh, people with disabilities to access these places um, would be a great boon. Uh, in actually providing access to uh, public lands for people with disabled people, uh, for people with disabilities. So thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate you uh, showing that that video, Mr. Hill. Let me let me go to you both from Rob's testimony that we just heard and Drew's testimony a little bit earlier. It's clear that the Department of Interior needs to improve uh, how it shares. Uh, information pertaining to levels of accessibility. And if we've already been talking about recreation.gov, I think a great website, uh, obviously intended uh, to, to provide information uh, about uh, visiting uh, some of the, our outdoor uh, areas. But can you explain perhaps some, uh, some information that probably should be included on the website to help provide individuals with disabilities a uh, more thorough understanding of the levels of accessibility? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I will. Let me also point out that one of the reasons that the Park Service and Fish and Wildlife Service have better information for their visitors is because the information exists, meaning they have policies uh, and their unit managers and facility managers know what those policies are and they've had some training in them. When you compare that to the Forest Service and BLM, in some cases, the lack of information is because there is no information on that topic. They haven't established a consistent policy across their facilities, uh, and the training for their unit managers isn't there either, which produces feedback, which would then be used to populate the website to provide the information that Mike and others are talking about. Um, I think one of the things that would be very helpful on recreation.com or generally by the agencies is to provide an activities-based approach to accessibility. And in my testimony, I use the phrase practical access. Mike is exactly right. Nobody with a disability is going to charge off into a, a place where they don't know exactly what they're going to expect. If you're a paraplegic or you're vision impaired, that's just dangerous. You just don't do it. What you end up doing is not going. Um, and that's the problem we're trying to address here. The activities that we want to undertake while we are there have ex practical accessibility features associated with them. Mike has referred to that repeatedly about the nature of the trails. Okay, we know there's a trail there, but is it accessible or not? Traveling the trail is an activity. Same thing for fishing if it's allowed, recreational shooting if it's allowed, hunting if it's allowed, and what we don't see right now is accessibility information oriented around the practical activities 
for which we want to visit the the the, the park to begin with. I think so that's that would be a big help. Great suggestion. Let me just end with this. I'm assuming you would also agree uh, that there's real benefit for having all of that on uh, one page, one space on the internet, rather than every agency trying to do their own thing. That would be helpful as well. Uh, is that no, correct? No. Yes, sir. No question. The, the individual land agency, because they have, as you know, different authorities, different charges uh, under the law, they need to come up with what this means for them, and it needs to be aggregated and put on recreation.com. We need a button up there right next to the three that you see where it says book a trip, plan an adventure. There needs to be a button that says accessibility. And then you press that and then we have what we need. As Mike pointed out, you've got eight, nine, 10 clicks as a disabled person to get down to the granularity that matters. And then often all you've got is a little blue wheelchair and that's it. It's just not practical. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chairwoman, appreciate it. I yield back. Absolutely, um, thank you very much. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Huffman, for his questioning. Thank you very much, Chair Porter, and thanks to our excellent witnesses from being here and offering some um, very powerful testimony. Uh, chair Porter, you're off to a great start. Uh, you've uh, given us a, a subject here that should be bipartisan very important to uh, all Americans. Uh, as you can see though, from the ranking members opening comments, some of our colleagues across the aisle would still like to kind of change the subject slightly from access for people with disabilities on our public lands, the bipartisan stuff, to a more partisan agenda of rolling back wilderness protections and opening more land to mining and drilling and other extractive industries. So I hope we can stay focused on the type of public access uh, that our witnesses here are talking about. Because in my district, I think in most parts of the country that have federal public lands, being active in the outdoors is part of our quality of life. And after the last year of lockdowns and isolation, I think getting outside for mental health and well-being has never been more important. These are benefits that should be accessible to all Americans. But uh, as we've heard today, uh, accessibility barriers come in many forms. So I'd like to start uh, by asking Ms. Bowen to elaborate a little more on how we can work toward uh, our goal uh, of providing that access. Ms. Bowen, you mentioned that most uh, access, the most accessible park sites happen to be the most popular. And uh, you've talked about how we need improvements uh, in the park reservation process to empower people with disabilities. Could you just elaborate on why an online lottery is um, a bad policy for uh, access for people with disabilities, and what's been your experience in terms of um, something that could work better? I think you're muted. Okay, so there I want to acknowledge the fact that because most of my um, disabilities are, I, I have more mobility than the other gentlemen in this, this call. Um, but so the predictability with the lottery system, it's <laughs> like if, if you have a bunch of medical appointments or you have people you rely on um, to gain you accessibility to these places, um, the lottery, lottery systems or um, not having real transparency or control of your access makes that more difficult. Um, and then also um, a plus one um, to Mr. Hill uh, with just trail conditions. Like if you look at any of the websites, there's no actual time stamp of when the site was actually last updated. So sometimes the services, the national forest pages are probably the worst. Um, they, they have a, information that's obviously been updated, but there's no timestamp after the California fires, trail conditions deteriorated. There's no update to that. So generally you end up doing a .gov site, a .com site, some Instagram photo recon, <laughs> like there's, it's ridiculous. And also comment boards of, you know, what feels safe. Like on my, my behalf, a lot of it is like, where do I feel safe? Um, to travel alone, um, or um, luckily I have my boyfriend, he's an experienced climber, 
um, where are rocks that I can climb um, that won't hurt my back. Um, so I guess really it just comes down to information and what you said with the lottery system. Um, I, I mean, as a former nurse at Walter Reed and I, I've helped other veterans um, as their wheelchair guide during the Invictus game. Um, the planning factors of travel, like traveling with a wheelchair, all of that is, is a burden for them. And um, I just don't, I don't think it's fair. All right, thank you very much. That, that need for better information has certainly come through loud and clear. Mr. Paso, you've talked about how uh, people with disabilities want different types of experience in our public lands. Uh, do you agree that we can make accessible improvements for recreation while continuing to protect these resources for biodiversity? And why is that important? Oh, absolutely. I think it's a, I think it's actually a, a fairly good balance already. And I think, um, you know, our research in terms of what people with disabilities desire, it very much mirrors what, what everybody desires. And, and the uh, you know one of my one of my premises I guess is that I I would like the maximum amount of accessibility that I can have without degrading the environment through which I'm going because if the environment that I'm going to visit is degraded there's no reason for me to go on that trail and people really value that wilderness experience it's something that you can't find very easily and it's very inaccessible to a wide swath of our population. So when people are able to get into those wildernesses, they need the, I, they generally agree whether they have a disability or not, that the, the primary purpose in those areas is to maintain that environment in its natural state. And um, people with disabilities agree with that. And then there's a whole spectrum of public land. And there's, you know, then the next step down is the national parks and they have a little bit more restrictions and then the forest service has even less restrictions. So then we can start to talk about some of those um, other power driven mobility device opportunities that could be appropriate for a forest service land or even a park, a national park, you know, there's, it's up to those local land managers to do that assessment to find out what types of reasonable accommodations are appropriate and make those available to people with disabilities when they come and going thanks, through that Mr. process. I know I'm, I'm out of time and I should yield back to the chair, but thanks so much uh, for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you very much. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Moore for his questioning. Thank you, chairwoman and ranking member. Uh, grateful to have the opportunity. Uh, I'm from, I come from Utah and we have our fair share of both beautiful landscapes and public lands and uh, making sure that, that, that everyone has an opportunity to enjoy these is, is very important to me and to, to all Utahns. Uh, I'll address my questions to Mr. Hill. Uh, from what we've heard, it's very clear that the department needs to improve how it shares accessibility information. In your testimony, you mentioned how recreation.gov is intended to be a clearinghouse for information needed to visit federal sites. Can you describe what information should be should be included and provide to provide individuals with disabilities a comprehensive understanding of of levels of accessibility? Uh, yes, sir. I, I think that an activity oriented uh, information set that looks at the practical information that someone like Mike or I uh, or Amy need for us to feel comfortable to go there is a huge first step. And that information is not particularly difficult to develop, it's just practical. It's seeing the uh, challenges of visiting from the point of view of someone that's disabled. And as we said earlier, disability is kind of a continuum here. Um, and the activities, however, are a saliency. And so that would be, I think, a step in the right direction, updating things in some way, having a timestamp on there, as Amy said, is a smart, a smart move as well so we understand how stale or not stale the information is excellent excellent thank you um and there are circumstances where accessibility to certain areas may not be feasible uh do you have any suggestions for the types of tools that we could equip land managers with to balance accessibility and conservation so that people with disabilities have the opportunity to enjoy even where it may be even more difficult. 
Yes, sir. I, I think the number one tool unit managers and facility managers need is a consistent policy and guidance from their agency on what they can do, uh, what their discretionary authority is, and encourage them to use it. Set the floor higher. You know, in, in 1992, one of the recommendations the, uh, NCD, National Council of Disability, made was to get the, the National Wilderness Preservation System land managers to develop guidelines for special permits and modifications that they could make for people with disabilities. Now, they did enter into an MOU with Wilderness Inquiry, I think in 1993 or 1994, and that's been productive, but it isn't the kind of policies and reliability that a unit manager needs to be comfortable making the special accommodations or permits that were included in the act. So we still have that gap, which 30, almost 30 years later, and that recommendation, in my view, is still pertinent and needs to be implemented. All right, thank you. Um, I'll, uh, with respect to wilderness areas, is there anything to consider with, um, with this population, with folks with disabilities um, that, 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 is of, that's, that warrants discussion? Um, are land managers hands, like with, the, with these designations, particularly of wilderness areas that may be more restrictive in some cases, does that affect this population in any way, shape or form um, in particular? I think it can have a disproportionate impact on the disability community in the following way. Uh, if the designations that occur, particularly designations of monuments, and we had an example a couple of years ago of the Castle Mountain National Monument. We had three monuments created all at the same time by executive order. But in the case of Castle Mountain, the executive order specifically placed management of that facility at the National Park Service. So the consequence of that was that hunting and shooting were not allowed on that monument. That's 21,000 acres of reasonably accessible land that people used to use that were disabled and able-bodied, but because of the designation there, we all lost the ability to further uh, undertake those activities on that land. Uh, it makes me wonder a bit about the 30 by 30, which sounds like a a meritorious idea from an environmental point of view, potentially, depending on how it's implemented and under what authority, but to the extent that that's going to remove more land and more activities that are allowed under land, it's going to be a challenge. There are finite places that are easy to get to uh, with disabilities, and, and some places like in Alaska where I've been with Chairman Young, unless you have extraordinary resources, you're just not going to be able to visit them. So it makes me concerned that some things that get placed into some kind of a protected status may inadvertently be ones that are particularly accessible for folks like Mike and Amy and I, but depending on how they get managed or designated, activities that we want to take there or visiting it at all may become impossible. So I would like a lot of thought put into that on this issue when lands are being uh, put under those kind of protections. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Hill. And Chairman, I, I yield back. Thank you. The chair now recognizes a gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Garcia, for his questioning. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Ranking Member. And of course, thanks to all the witnesses uh, this uh, morning, afternoon. Everyone deserves uh, to the great out deserves access to the great outdoors and the proven health benefits that come with it. But the reality is that for a person with a disability, planning a trip or getting outdoors requires some planning and accommodations that those without disabilities may never even think about. This is a very personal issue for me. My incredible wife, Evelyn, lives with multiple sclerosis. We've come a long way, but people with disabilities are limited and limited. Mobility still face barriers, including accessing parks and public lands. Uh, a question for uh, Ms. Julie Edmonds, uh, Edmonston. Uh, Ms. Edmonston, organizations like this inquiry are obviously very, very critical in that they provide an important bridge for connecting people with disabilities to the outdoors. Uh, can you tell us more about how your partnerships 
with the Park Service and other land management agencies have helped you expand from a small organization based in Minnesota to a national one? Yes, thank you, Representative. Um, I mean, I, I would say that as, as an organization that's working with the different federal um, land management agencies, having partnership agreements and co-op agreements have have helped us come a long way. So for example, um, with the National Park Service, uh, they have established agreements with us that not only help, help us gain greater access to their staff with some of our programs um, and just become more knowledgeable about accessible areas, um, but also provide some funding to be able to scale our programs. Um, and we've been able to do that with a number of different land management agencies, uh, most recently, uh, the USDA Forest Service and their Urban Connections Program with Region 9. Um, they have funding that is also specifically for youth with disabilities to get out. So I know that a number of folks on, on this call have recognized that some agencies might be farther along than others and National Park Service might be one of them. And I think that other agencies um, might be working to do that through partnerships with organizations like Wilderness Inquiry. So the Forest Service is certainly one um, we have done some work with Bureau of Land Management out in California and Utah um, to connect uh, youth, including youth with disabilities, um, to their, their public lands in the area. And so I do think that um, those types of partnerships really help not just create those connections for people with disabilities, but also help organizations like ours build the capacity needed um, to offer it to a greater um, audience. Thank you. And very briefly, is it possible for Wilderness Inquiry to grow even more? In other words, is it a scalable model for outreach to people with disabilities? Yes, absolutely. I think that um, an example of how we have done that is, uh, you know, we started a program um, called Mobile that was based only right in, in Minnesota, initially the Twin Cities. And we did a demonstration project in Washington, D.C., in which the National Park Service helped support and saw, wow, this is phenomenal. We want this more places. And now we go coast to coast um, serving people. We took, you know, individuals uh, with hearing loss out onto the Charles River in Boston, out to uh, Santa Barbara, um, served a disability serving organization out there. And um, it once again has created significant capacity for us. And it is realistically um, scalable to, to no end. Um, essentially, we, we are good at the logistics, um, building the partnerships, working with other organizations. Um, and, and so essentially, the, the scalability is um, certainly in a possibility. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Paso, uh, thank you for joining us. In your uh, testimony, you describe, uh, quote, the lack of information being the single greatest barrier to accessibility on public lands. How can the federal government better leverage existing resources? Yes, sir. Um, I, I, um, well, we've talked about rec.gov, so I won't go too much into that. I do think there's a great amount that can be done on recreation.gov. The other, the other elements, I think the, the federal government is, is uniquely positioned to really cr bring together a set of information that they would like to see and then the states can follow up with that and local agencies and even private agencies can follow up with what what's wanted and and the the usgs digital trails project comes to mind in trails because i think trails are there's a very very important lack of information on trails and i think the that funding that digital trails project to a greater degree, I think they, they might be out of funding as far as I know. So I'd encourage you to look into that and, and find more funding for them, but they, they could serve as a really good coagulating effect on trails and could, could set out a schema that would allow people to get certain consistent data out to the public. And then that platform is available to the public, whereas all trails and other trail resources are not uh, unless you pay. Thank you, Mr. Apostle. Uh, it's very clear that uh, the ball is in Congress's court. We must uh, move on making the great outdoors accessible to all people. Madam Chair, this is a great hearing. Thank you so much. Uh, I yield back to you and thank you for your indulgence. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Garcia. Um, we're going to have the opportunity if any members wish to ask a second round of questioning, they are able to. Um, and I'm going to begin um, with uh, following up with uh, Mr. Paso and Ms. Edmondson. Um, Mr. Paso, one of the points that you make so powerfully is that that there is not attention in many instances, particularly when it comes to trails with regard to what is a conservation, um, ecologically minded trail design, and what provides accessibility for individuals. Um, you mentioned things like the grade. Um, are there examples besides trails that you can think of to illustrate that this tension um, can be minimized in many instances that best practices for our environment can be also consistent with promoting accessibility? Um, you, I'm sorry, your question was beyond trails? Yes, beyond where that trails would be, you've done okay. a fabulous job on, but beyond trails, um, how can we think about other kinds of um, accessibility that is both um, environmentally consistent and accessible? Yeah, well, I think, you know, there's the, the whole idea of universal design is something that we've kind of skirted around and that applies to trails, obviously, but also things like campgrounds and even the way that campgrounds are set up and picnic areas are set up within a park or within a within a forest area and they those those um the the concepts of universal design not only serve more than people with disability just disabilities you know they serve everybody to a greater degree like for example a great example i guess is is like the universal design fire pit that you'd see in an accessible campground usually the base is raised 18 inches off the ground and that's easier for you to use isn't it you know you don't have to lean all the way down to light that fire or to add another stick it's just plain easier for everybody and that crosses the spectrum of, of a whole variety of areas um, so implementing the, those universal design and into sustainability is critical because it, it creates much more sustainable um, facilities and trails and structures over the long period. I agree with that. And I think, you know, one of the things that um, has come up in this hearing is that many Americans will experience um, a period of disability in their lives, particularly the you know, aging population, people with young children. I am also often very, very grateful as someone who's taken a lot of Cub Scouts um, and a lot of children on camp trips to have additional information um, and to be able to do more planning to keep everybody in my group safe. Um, Ms. Edmonston, you talked about um, that this, camp, this, this role of taking people into the wilderness can be scaled. Um, and so one of the things I wanted to, to flag for you is that we're sending a letter. Um, I'm sending a letter along with Representative Nagoose and Representative Deget to request full funding for the Every Kid Outdoors program. We're specifically requesting um, an additional $5 million to help increase access for children with disabilities. Um, can you talk about as a parent of a child with disabilities, as someone who has led these trips themselves, um, why do you think it's important for the whole family to be able to go together? What do kids with disabilities draw from these experiences? Yes, well, well thank you for the question and thank you for your support um, of that funding. And, and we're really excited about that and have, have worked with that program before. So that's um, fantastic. And I would say from, from the family perspective, I mean, if if we each think about our own stories or connection to the wilderness, I know for me personally, um, a lot of the bonding that I have with my family and a lot of the memories that I cherish in my family are us going outdoors together. Like you were talking about, um, Chairwoman, of you know going to national parks and you build those relationships um, with your your whole family union. And even though they still make fun of me for you know being afraid to go to the bathroom in grizzly country, um, that's what makes us a family. And I think whether the family experiences disability and whether that's a parent or whether that's the child, that's just such a critical thing to do together as a unit. And we really established our family program at Wilderness Inquiry with the idea around providing the supports for an entire family um, to have that experience together and have the supports needed to do that. Um, because as everybody on this call has talked about, there's so many enormous benefits. And as, as Mr. Hill and others have said, just the healing powers of the outdoors, I think, um, 
are are so needed and and disability um shouldn't shouldn't play a role in in whether somebody has access to that um, I want to ask each of you um, if there's a particular successful park um, that comes to mind um, and if you could give the example of what that park was, but also what was it? Was it information? Was it interpretive? Was it something the staff did? Um, can you think of an example to point this committee to of uh, either you know federal, state, local park and then tell us what was made it so great? So I'll just run down the line here and start with Ms. Bowen. I think it depends on the activity. <laughs> so um, Red Rock Canyon um, in Nevada is really getting, uh, making a reservation is very easy. The road access to the trail is really easy. Um, and there are multiple types of activities to do. And also the Pinnacles is really good. Um, they have very developed trails and they have tr um, climbing areas really close to main trails. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Edmonston? Um, the first that comes to mind for me is the Apostle Islands National Lakeshore, just because they're being very intentional about doing some infrastructure updates with um, boardwalks on the islands and um, tent platforms and they have some plans that I think they're just waiting on funding for to make some ramps for there's beautiful areas with sea caves but you have to go down this huge stairway to get to um, so the plans to improve that but um, even I just recently heard about Cuyahoga National Park revamping the visitor center Olympic National Parks working on very detailed trail guides so kind of to Miss Bowen's point it, it sort of depends on the activity and what type of accessibility matter but there's some great work mm -hmm. Mr. Hill Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. I guess I would refer to the Blackwater Refuge over in Maryland across the Chesapeake from here. Um, for years, we had a unit manager there. There's a lot of hunting of sika deer and other wild, uh, uh, fowl shooting there. And for years, the uh, unit manager there was, and he was the key to this, was accommodating. He understood. He had gone out of his way to make some facilities there, some blinds and other things accessible. He understood what the law was, and he understood what authority he had to make special accommodations. And when he left, that declined. Again, coming back to you know, the law and authority, it all comes down to the person implementing it and the training they have and their willingness to be collaborative. Uh, they have to encounter a reasonable person you know, that's disabled can't demand, we can't demand everything all the time. That's irrational too. But that individual was the key there. I had a great experience out there. Um, and so that's what I would point to. Why so good? It was that man. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful because I think one of the things we've seen is the National Park Service has implemented additional training for supervisors and unit managers. Um, but I think there's one of the things that I've gotten out of this hearing is there's a real role for uh, Bureau of Land Management and National Forests to perhaps improve their training um, and the clarity and understanding of unit managers about what is possible um, to improve accessibility. Um, Mr. Paso, any particular park or example of accessibility in a park that you could leave the committee with as a as a, a kind of aspirational great example? Yeah, yeah, I'm actually going to kind of follow up on what Graham just said. The the California State Parks, unfortunately, a big part of the ADA is is it's it's run by um, being sued for problems, <laughs> and that can be a bad thing, um, you know, in terms of perception. But California State Parks was sued, and they do they dove head on into providing accessibility information in their parks. And they took the lead role out of that whole effort. Uh, and it came from two really, really committed and passionate land managers at the state parks that really drove it forward. And they took it just from complying with what the, the, the suit had to say and took it to the next level and really did a great job of providing that information. And I think still, even though that was back in the 90s, you know, the data is still there and available. And, and I've had some amazing experiences in national parks where they've, they've um, merged the sustainability of trails. So you can go on a trail that's totally, you know, accessible according to ABA guidelines and 
not even know that it's an accessible trail. It doesn't have signage. It's just how it is. And they did all of their trails that way. It's really, really spectacular. Thank you for that example. If there are no other members um, uh, who would like to question, I want to close by giving each witness. Um, I have been a congressional witness. I know how difficult it is to, to have your time limited um, and to have people ask you certain questions and not ask you others. So I want to close, and this will be my practice, um, by giving each witness an opportunity to share any additional thoughts um, or any closing remarks. So Ms. Bowen, we'll start with you. If you can limit yourself here to a couple minutes, we'd really love to hear from you. Anything else you want to add or teach us today? Um, well, I just wanted to get, just say thank you for letting me talk about my experience. This is actually the first time I spoke publicly about it. So I went big. Um, I, I think that I'm not alone um, with, with this. Like, I, there's been a lot of women veterans with sexual trauma in the military. We're in this purgatory space with some with physical disabilities, but not as not as limited as other veterans. And we're in this in between place of where do we fit in? And that's where the Park Service and the, well, National Public Lands is for us. So I just want to thank you for the opportunity to um, really champion um, on behalf of other women that are going through the same thing. Thank you, Representative. Um, so I guess I would I would just like to echo uh, Mr. Passel's thoughts on universal design, and I think the importance of that, and I think that um, that's something that we could continue to make a lot of progress in. Um, also, we were just part of another um, accessibility training and panel with the National Park Service, which um, panelists talked about how the importance of having someone communicate directly with you if you are a person with a disability and if you are, are entering a visitor center and whether you maybe have a, a, a recognizable disability or a mobility issue or you are deaf or you are blind, that that there are not assumptions made and people talk directly with you and, and share what is possible at the park and not make assumptions of what you may or may not be interested in, just like some of the other panels talking about too. Um, just because you might use a wheelchair doesn't mean you might not be interested in um, one of the trails, but you just might need more information about it. Um, and I guess I'll just close by saying um, how appreciative we are for, for the federal government's role in this and cooperative agreements that um, help organizations like ours can continue to work with people of all abilities and help make those connections and bridges to public lands. Um, that is really significant um, support and we're looking forward to doing even more together. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Porter. So uh, on universal design, um, when we passed the, NC, uh, the, the ADA and we didn't realize it was going to create the, the, the ceiling that it has instead of a floor. Uh, many years ago, I co-founded the Global Universal Design Commission that we run out of the Burton Blatt Institute at University of Syracuse. And universal design, which uh, both Mike and Julie have mentioned, uh, is the way forward. It's the way to move past thinking about this as disabled and not disabled. Universal design makes whatever we're doing better for an able-bodied person, as we say at the commission, it's ballerinas and linebackers and everybody in between. Uh, that's the, the real way uh, going forward that we should be thinking about the issue of design accommodation, design standards, because then we get past the issue of Mike or Amy or I being able to not go somewhere that Julie can go or vice versa. It's built for everybody. So I would I didn't include that in my testimony here, but uh, that is ultimately the way to have all of this be the floor so that people like Mike mentioned in California, my experience uh, out at the Blackwater, those folks are then inspired to go above and beyond because it's helping all of their customers. They're no longer then dealing with, well, I've got this one special customer set here that I've got to go out of the way and take a risk to accommodate because someone may get upset or I define disability wrong 
I've got a guy in a wheelchair, but then another guy shows up with a heart condition, says he's entitled to the same accommodation. All that goes away if we design this around universal design. So that would be my the one thing I'd emphasize I didn't include in my testimony. Thank you Thank for you. having this hearing. Of course, Mr. Passo. Thanks, thanks, Chair Porter. Um, I I feel like um, I feel like we've ripped a little bit on the Forest Service and the BLM in this and and the staff. And I I just want to make it very clear that I have never met more dedicated and more eager people in my life than the people I work with in the Forest Service and the BLM, especially and the Park Service as well. They want to they want to do what we're talking about, but the the Hiring freezes of the last decade have made it so that they're all wearing 20 hats. And when the fire season comes, that hat covers their entire body for months. And the reality is, I think they need they need help. They need to have people that can be dedicated to this issue and can put put their mind and their energy to work on this. And when that happens with the training supporting those people, um, then great things can happen on these public lands. And until that happens, it's going to inherently probably be a lower priority because fire season, you know, like fire season covers everything. Um, so I, I encourage robust funding of staffing for the Forest Service and the BLM especially, um, but also the Park Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and I don't think... I made that very clear in my testimony. So I just wanted to make sure that that was out there. So thanks for that opportunity and thanks for the opportunity to talk to you all today. Well, I really appreciate that. And I think that you're, one of the things that's come through is when we make this a priority and we dedicate resources to it, there absolutely are wonderful people, both in our communities, in organizations, um, and at our uh, federal public lands agencies who can help us come up with ways to make public lands accessible and enjoyable for all Americans, including people with disabilities. And I just want to echo um, the comments that you've all made about universal design. Um, you know, as someone who has put a uh, high chair in her minivan and gone out and gone camping with a baby in a high chair. Um, I'm really grateful if I can find an accessible, universally designed picnic table so I can pull that baby up to the picnic table um, and take that stroller um, on that accessible trail to take my kids out. So thank you very much for all your suggestions and all your hard work. Um, the members of the committee uh, may have some additional questions for you um, as witnesses, and we will ask you to respond to those in writing. Under committee rule 3.0, members of the committee must submit with witness questions within three business days following the hearing, and the hearing record will be held open for 10 business days for these responses. If there is no further business, without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned.